explain to me what happened around this area and your uh, Eamon de Valera's involvement? Well, I, first of all, I think you have to look at the way the rising was planned. And despite maybe modern theories to the contrary, the rising was planned with quite a logical plan in place. And the idea was that the battalions on this side were to protect the city from attack from the south and from the west. So you had the third battalion here, you had the fourth battalion next to them and so on. And if you actually think of the displacement, you had Boland's Mills protecting the canal here. The next battalion up were the fourth battalion, they were connecting the, protecting the canal from Leeson Street all the way down towards the uh, South Dublin Union, which is now St. James's Hospital. And they were protected all the way out to the city. Okay. Now, the other thing we must remember is that the main barracks in Dublin at the time were on the south of the city, and also the main possible entry point for reinforcement was from the southwest, the south, and obviously from Dulaira, where troops were going to come in yeah. from Britain. They couldn't bring the troops directly into Dublin because the doctors weren't willing to land the ships. So there was a problem there for the British, and the obvious place to come in was into Kingstown, which was very loyal to the British sure. at the time. So the attack was expected in this direction. Now, of course, all of the battalions here were severely short of troops. Mm. So you have to understand the plan was much better than the reality. Absolutely. But that said, uh, when we look at the collapse of the Rising, uh, yeah. none of these battalions actually uh, were defeated. They all voluntarily surrendered. That includes Jacobs, South Dublin Union, and Boland's Mills, of course, which was the last to surrender. The only one that surrendered because they were military defeated was uh, the GPO. And again, you have to look at the theory behind uh, what the volunteers had done. There was an argument, and I remember Granda talking about this, between my grandfather and James Connolly before the Rising. James Connolly maintained that the capitalists of Dublin, who were tended to be pro-British, would not allow uh, the British shell the city. Mm. Um, my grandfather argued that they would, as it turned out, they did. Uh, reality was that they actually got burnt out of the GPO. They didn't get shot out of the GPO, they got burnt out of the GPO, and that was following the shelling and the fact that O'Connell Street went up in a blaze and eventually the GPO caught fire. They had to surrender because they were totally surrounded and they couldn't stay where they were because the buildings were burning. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, militarily, the rest of the garrisons were never defeated and surrendered voluntarily at the end of the rising. So the plan was not as you know, you know, self sacrifice yeah. as people think. And again, all military experts would tell you that you're in a fantastically advantageous position when in urban fighting, when you're defending and they're attacking. Yeah. Now, what happened here is interesting because I think it shows you the thinking of the times. The mm. British soldiers landed out in Dunlera mm. and they came in along this road. Now, why did they pick this road rather than either going to Bagot Street, mm. which was undefended? Yeah. Uh, Leeson Street wasn't undefended, but Bagot Street was because there weren't enough troops. Sure. Or why did they didn't go in Shelburne Road and sure. go in along uh, Pierce Street? God only knows, okay. or why they weren't brought in by train along the railway line, which was also expected. Okay. I, I don't have the explanation for that, but they came along the road here. Now, the extraordinary thing is that when they came under fire, yeah. instead of going for cover, uh, I suppose the British hadn't been trained in uh, urban warfare, but they proceeded to make a frontal attack on the two defenders in the Northumberland Road house, right at the corner of Haddington Road. I see. Yeah. Uh, there were two people in the house. Mm. Uh, Lieutenant Malone, Michael Malone, had been given, and his own family have told me this, his uh, grand-nephew came in to see me recently, that he said that my grandfather, when he sent the detachment up here, gave him his mortar, mother automatic pistol. Mm. And he said, this is the best gun I have, and it proved very, very effective. And then Grace, who was with him, he also had the Leanfield rifle, which nowadays would be seen as a very old-fashioned gun. You pull the bolt and you, but at least you could put a number of bullets in it at a go and just keep reloading. The British troops would use that a lot more at the Lee Enfield, I think, at oh, the time. They would as have well. had that as standard issue. Yeah. But remember, the main weapons mm -hmm. that were available to the volunteers, other than pikes and things, were the one shot Mauser rifles that were totally obsolete by the time of the First World War, sure. that had been used and captured in the Franco Prussian Wars of the late 19th century, had come in on the host and killed cool. Uh, gun running. 
And they were the main weapon that the troops have, which were very, very ineffective compared to, for example, the Enfield rifle, particularly when you were talking about numbers. Uh, there was huge damage inflicted down mm -hmm. there. Um, eventually, mm -hmm. the house was overpowered and the British were absolutely astounded that they found one body inside that was left to Malone and Grace had escaped out That's the right. back and over the wall. Uh, and it's extraordinary to think that anybody survived that particular attack on the house. They then came up here and of course the whole object of the exercise was to defend the canal mm -hmm. because uh, you know, nowadays you put a bailey bridge across wherever you want yeah. but the British soldiers coming in had no equipment. Obviously if they went into the water the rifles and all the equipment would have got wet, sure. so they really were dependent on coming across one of the bridges. Stupidly, they should have just gone back and gone round, mm. but they didn't. They actually attacked the bridge, and then across behind me, you have Clan William House. Correct, yes. And Clan William House had, I think, seven in it. Uh, a number of those were killed, but again, a number survived. Sure. Uh, and they put up an incredible bat battle until the house got literally burnt out and they had to evacuate. So that's how the Battle of Mount Two Bridge happened. A lot of the casualty was caused by the British attitude towards war, their approach to war, that troops were expendable, that if they had a thousand troops, they didn't really care how many they lost. Like World War One in a way. It maybe. was World War One. Yeah. It was right in the middle of World War One, mm. and they were using the same tactics as they were using in the trenches, which was, was human life doesn't matter, our troops don't matter, we have more than the other side will eventually win out. Although it is interesting, they were the Sherwood Foresters. Now, I was looking at the records of the account of Captain Hitson. I was given oh, yeah. his papers uh, by his grandniece, uh, and he was the officer that took the surrender from him, de Valera. But before he took the surrender, they were in this area, two or three days of the Rising. They were not involved in the Battle of Mount Street Bridge. They had snipers placed up in the bell tower of Haddington Road Church, which was my parish church when I was growing up. <laughs> um, and they basically were in this area. Now his description sure. is that for those days they were pinned down. They actually didn't advance. They didn't know how many volunteers were there. Okay. They didn't advance and every time they put up their head somebody shot at them from Bowlands Mill. Uh, so they were kind of in a fixed position. Obviously the garrison in Bowlands Mill's job was to defend the position. Sure. They were never going to go out for attack. And he describes his surprise that when de Valera surrendered and he went back and he got his troops that According to Captain Hitson's count, there yeah. was 117 uh, members in the garrison okay. uh, at the end of the Rising. Sure. And um, a lot of them he described as being only boys. And they were covering a huge area over including Pier Street. And they didn't know which direction the attack was coming from. So when you take that they probably started the Rising with less than 130 men, mm. um, when you take the size and number of the roads in this area, the number of possible points of attack, you actually find out that the numbers you could literally uh, put in any position was five or ten. And Professor Hayes McCoy, in his military description of the Rising back in 1966, produced a very, very interesting map because not only did he show you the main battalion points, but he actually showed where all of the disposition of the volunteers and the citizen army was in small areas, in other words, where all the outposts were. I counted for Boland's Mills 10 different dispositions really? of troops, which if you divide it by 130 gives you 13 per disposition. Uh, yeah, yeah. And that just shows you yeah. how short on the ground they were. And then when you add the ill equipment in, that some equipment like the Mauser were way, way superior, even the Lee Enfield rifle was way superior mm. than the, the, the guns that the majority of the troops had, you see that there was a massive, massive logistical exercise uh, in trying to defend your position. Well, I suppose two interesting stories about Poland's Mills. Um, the first shell that was shot from the Helga actually hit Poland's Mills mm. and obviously he was very concerned about this and sure. what he did was there was a nearby disused distillery and he went up and he put an Irish flag on the top of the distillery. Mm. Uh, the British started shelling the distillery which pleased him tremendously because there was nobody there but apparently when he was going up putting the flag he suffered from vertigo yeah. He wasn't a good man in heights, okay. more than I am, yeah. uh, and uh, apparently when he was going up putting up the flag he didn't know whether he was more afraid of being hit by a shell or falling from the heights. Yeah. But that was a funny little story about 1916. The other story was that down at Pier Street Station there were a lot of sidings and he was patrolling the sidings, each, the, the rail line each night and mm. to stop 
to see where the trains or troops coming in sure. from Dunlaira, uh, which was then Kingstown. Uh, and this night he got so tired he said he just had to lie down. So he broke into a carriage and slept till morning. Uh, when he woke up in the morning, he found that he had broken into the carriage uh, that the king had had, in other words, the royal carriage, that the king had had during his tour of Ireland a few years previous. And as he described it himself, he thought he was in heaven because there's all, all these sheriffs and seraphims over his head on the ceiling. And I've seen the carriage, it's preserved yeah, by the yeah. Royal Preservation Society. Sure. And when you go inside, you actually see it has this very ornate ceiling on it. But actually what he had done was slept in the royal carriage. It was the same carriage that he used as the presidential carriage during his presidency in the 60s. Okay. Uh, could you tell me how Eamon de Valera got involved in nationalist politics? Well, or, yeah. you know, he, he grew up in Bury and there was a priest down there who was very involved in the Land League and in fact was involved in 1916 subsequently. Right. And he was a very, very famous Land League priest when sure. he was growing up. So it's thought that he had quite uh, an influence on him. Now one other interesting thing that I only became aware of uh, in the last three months, I went to America and I visited the grave of my great-grandmother uh, Catherine Carl and oh, yeah. she was the mother of M. de Valera and it's interesting to read the letter she wrote to her son, her other son, um, Father Thomas Wheelwright in 1916 and she makes, it's a very well written letter for somebody yeah. who would have left school with a primary uh, education. She talks about perfidious Albion, so obviously the uh, republican or nationalistic streak was even strong in her. So presumably her brothers who raised, her brother and her mother who raised her Valera were of a very nationalist bent, as most, I think, rural Irish people were. Now, de Valera went to uh, school here. It's not very evident uh, in his Black Rock days that he was particularly nationalistic, uh, but I think probably the turning point was when he joined the Gaelic League um, and met my grandmother. Yeah. Now, she is very, very interesting in her own right. She came from a very nationalistic background. Her father supported Parnell in the split. She, as a young child, used to always boast to us that as a young child, she attended uh, uh, the funeral of Parnell. Nice. Um, and also, she would have been scathing in her disregard for, for example, people like Cardinal Cullen, who she would have seen as Castle Catholic. So she was very, very strong nationalist. So you could say that when my grandparents got married in 1910, that there was a huge you know, reinforcement of their nationalism. Yeah. And I, I would imagine my grandmother had a huge influence on my grandfather. No doubt he had a big influence on her, but you could really see it throughout their long life, an absolute meeting of minds between the two of them. Uh, and certainly she was you know, unequivocal in you know, her commitment to the cause. So, the two of them were involved in the Gaelic League when the volunteers had been set up. Uh, on the night it was set up in the Rotunda, de Valera joined the volunteers. Mm. Now you have to understand, for his time he was a professor of mathematics, he had been a self-made man. He had very little opportunity in life, but he had made his own opportunities. But by that stage he was a professor of mathematics, yeah. uh, would have been, you know, natural leader. And he rapidly rose through the ranks of the volunteers till he became a commandant in the volunteers and was very involved in the funeral and committees for the funeral of uh, uh, O'Donovan Ross and so on. So you're talking about somebody who, I suppose, his organisational ability showed even in the pre-1916 period. Yeah. Um, and he wound up as the battalion commander here. Now why here? Well that's very easily explained. Yeah. Uh, he was living at the time in Morehampton Terrace, which is just off Morehampton Road, at very, very near Marlborough Road and Herbert Park, that junction there. It's a little terrace of houses there. They were living a nice, comfortable lifestyle there. Uh, and that's where they were living. So it was obvious that he was in the volunteers in this, in the Pembroke area here, down as far as Rings End and the canal. And the story is that before the rising, he came down here with uh, my uncles and my uncle uh, Vivian. And I'm not sure that he didn't bring Auntie Marlin as well. Pretending he was bringing the children for a walk, but he was actually recognising <laughs> this area right? for his yeah. plan. So he had quite a developed plan for yeah. defending the area okay. uh, prior to the rising. So that's how he got involved. He was a great man for seeing other solutions. You know, something didn't go right. I heard it described it, like a mathematician's brain. You can see, like, if, 
A doesn't go right, well then here's B, here's C, here's D, just in case something falls down. Well, he would have been very methodical. An interesting thing that uh, was told me recently, I, I had heard it and I'd half forgotten it, but uh, I met my cousin Eamon, nice. uh, another Eamon, we're all Eamon, <laughs> uh, and we were just talking about the rising and he said that towards the end of the rising, he gathered all of the men yeah. and what they were looking at was evacuating and heading for the hills before the, they would be totally surrounded because they weren't really under that much pressure mm. and they could have escaped out here and gone into South Dublin and up the Dublin mountains uh, and then he decided against it but he did actually gather all the men together because in that way uh, I think he would have felt that uh, they could have escaped and continued the fight. Now I, I've heard numerous different versions of the Devil Air escape and execution and reasons for or against. Would you care to share some light on us? Or? Well, yes, um, there's no doubt about it that both his mother and my grandmother, in other words, his wife, Sinead de Valera, made some effort to go to the various consulates. He was always absolutely adamant uh, that the reason he escaped execution was that after he was arrested, he was brought out to where the RDS is. Oh, yeah. There was a fire station down there and he was detained there for two days and then they marched those troops to Richmond. So when you look at the records, mm. you find that he was one of the last to be tried. Now, as you know, halfway through the executions, or very near the end of the execution, uh, the British uh, Prime Minister Asquith came mm. to Ireland and an end was put to the executions with two exceptions, sure. uh, Connolly and uh, uh, McDermott. Yeah. And all the evidence would seem to bear this out. There was a very good book published about 18 months ago about the trials and all the evidence from the trials and the British papers themselves would seem to indicate that he was just the lucky guy, that the delay was the crucial matter, not a medical citizenship. Sure. And the historic evidence is that he was incorrect in that. Uh, it is interesting to note that he wasn't so definitive when he was in America because he didn't want to uh, in any way deny the efforts that had been made on his behalf by people in America, but he was utterly convinced. Okay. And the British historical record confirms this, that the reason was the delay in bringing him to Richmond. Sure. How do you think he did so well in the election subsequently? Uh, well, you know, 1917 by election. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think, sorry. you know, definitely Ching Fein were beginning to get in the role. He had become this iconic feature, uh, figure um, as the last commandant to surrender after the death of Tomás Ash, he was the most senior surviving commandant from the Rising. Mm. And I think that certainly uh, helped him in the very, very initial role. Mm. But I think subsequently, you know, considering that he fought his last election in 1966, I think it was to do with his personality and his political ability, not to his military ability. And I think very, very early on, when you look at the you know, formulations he came up with, Mm. Uh, to try to reconcile Griffith's uh, dual monarchy theory mm. with the very Republican, as uh, Repu Republican aspirations of the volunteers in the 1916 uh, people. That's right, that's right. Uh, because remember, Sinn Féin was not involved in that's 1916. Right. Yeah, yeah. It was only the British thought that. And Sinn Féin was moderate compared to most of the 1916 position. Mm. Uh, he came up with a very clever formulation to try to square the circle in terms of saying that what they were looking for was Ireland's right to self-determine nation. And then when you'd ask him, uh, well, what then? He would say, well, it is my view that if Irish people get self-determination, they'll vote for republic, but we're not looking for the republic, we're looking for self-determination. And in that way, he could bring the grip of the wing yes. of Sinn Féin with them and the republican wing with them and a common uh, aim, self-determination. And that was very important in the movement from 1918 to 21. Sure. Now, obviously, in 1921, it caused its own difficulties because it was getting more and more difficult to hold this massive coalition sure. together of quite differing views. But it certainly worked in that period. And I think you see De Valera, the drafter of words, the politician, the person who thought out problems and found solutions by understanding that the nature of politics is words, is formulations, and is bringing people with you. And therefore, I think he went on a very steep learning curve. It's also my view that his sojourn in America uh, hugely matured him. I think you see a lot of mm. uh, things from that 
visit. Uh, obviously, he'd been exposed to world politics and American politics, taught him a whole lot of things, even down to the style of oratory. And I was fascinated talking to uh, a very, very old person about 15 years ago who had been at meetings he spoke at, and I asked him about his speaking technique. Hmm. And he said that he would speak very, very slowly at the beginning and that he always had a rail on him. But he said by the end he'd get very passionate and he'd be thumping the rail and any you know, we say portrayals of him nowadays as a very dead, you know, lacking in energy, mm. were totally disabused by, you know, this eyewitness account. Uh, and when I said to him that I thought, I'd heard he wasn't a great speaker, this person was totally annoyed at me, even though they knew me very, very well and knew my connection, yeah. and said that that was rubbish. And I remember I kept saying to him, but I heard he wasn't a great orator, and he kept saying back to me, uh, you know, if it weren't you, who you were, I'd be absolutely mad at you because he yeah. said it just was not true. But one interesting thing was this slow build up and then getting into a climax and yeah. pounding the thing. Yeah. Martin Luther King, yeah. Southern preachers, yeah. all the American way of political speaking that we've seen in the 60s even. Yeah. Uh, I think he had learned this all in America and he had seen these fantastic orators and how they built it up to a crescendo and then really pushed the point home, uh, I think it was important. The second thing I was told about his communication skills, which is interesting, is that what this informant and other people had told me when I asked them, people who had been at his uh, meeting, they'd always tell you he could change your mind, that he really had good arguments, yeah. that he wasn't a demagogue yeah. and that he could change people's mind. And one interesting caveat, you've often heard of James Dillon, great leader of the Parliamentary yeah, Party, yeah. former leader of Fennel Well, right into the 40s. Mm. Uh, James Dillon, um, de Valera said to him one day in the dial, James Dillon was a marvellous arbiter. And James Dill de Valera said to James Dillon one day in the dial, privately, he said, you're a fantastic arbiter. And James Dillon, in fairness to him, said back to him, he said, yes, Dev, but they listen to you. So, whereas he mightn't have been in a classical sense the greatest yeah. orator, yeah. he certainly had this ability that James Dillon even testified to, that he could actually grab the imagination of people. And to me, that's where he got his long-term political strength. What kind of person do you think he was as, as a, you know, a grandfather? Was? Well, you know, he's an incredibly ordinary person. Yeah. Um, I have memories going back to mid-50s. Well, my first memory of him, I can date as my third birthday, right. which was the 26th or the 23rd of June, uh, 1953. Sure. And the reason I can remember it is that he gave me a present of a gold watch since I was called Damon, and I have the watch still, obviously. Uh, and I can remember himself and my father looking at the inscription at the back of the watch and they came into the house at home, so I can actually date my first memory. But he was like an expected grandfather, before he went up to Ars Nostra and they were living in Black Rock, we were living in mm -hmm. between Ballsbridge and Donnybrook. So he'd be sent in with the messages and he'd call at the house and we loved him. And, yeah. uh, you know, we treated him as you would treat a grandfather and we'd either race the car to the end of the road where he'd be going or he'd allow us to get into the car and where these pull out seats in the, right. in the back of the car and he could pull out the seats and we'd sit in the seats and he'd allow us to sit in the seats and he'd drive down the road and then we'd open the doors and run home. Very you know, so he was very tolerant that way and yeah. same that kind of very, very, you know, normal family behaviour uh, continued when we went to the Auras, which was a place we loved to visit. It was a fantastic house with <laughs> plenty of grounds and so on. Yeah. They were very, very tolerant with us and, okay. um, you know, I can remember one time we arrived up in the Auras in an evening and we had a habit of playing hurling and football around the grounds. And, yeah. Uh, enjoying ourselves yeah. and one, this evening we were hanging around and we didn't think it would be a long enough visit to get out and go playing yeah. so we hadn't brought anything with us yeah. so he asked why we weren't out playing and we explained to him the next day we arrived in the orders he bought three hurling sticks and a slitter to make sure that he, if that ever happened again we wouldn't be stuck for something to play with so oh, you know, he was that kind of a very very thoughtful and yeah. uh, kind person uh, funny enough the nearest blood relation to Parik Pierce hmm. uh, was telling me recently an interesting little story because when they went up to the Auras there were these goldfish ponds just outside the, the in the ornamental gardens behind the, the house in the Auras 
and the water was quite deep in them and he was afraid, because some of my cousins were very, very young, that they'd fall into the goldfish pond. Yeah. So he personally rang the OPW uh, to see whether they could do something about this to put in a wire mesh or something so that if a child did fall in, they wouldn't drown. Oh, wow. And uh, the story was, anyway, he got onto the OPW and he spoke Irish. <laughs> so they sent for this relative of Pierce. He be, would have been a grand nephew, well, a step-grand nephew of okay. P.H. Pierce, uh, but has been the only Irish speaker there. And he <laughs> had to deal with the query. And I can actually remember yeah. that grid being put in. I was nine years of age at the time. So what was jail time like for him? Um, um, I don't really know. Mm. Um, it's a funny thing, like, we were told endless stories and we asked him about political issues and so on. Um, the worst jail he was ever in, this was the one, uh, you know, there were a number of jail stories. But, uh, you know, prison wasn't easy. Yeah. Descriptions of breaking the windows when they went into total disobedience in Dartmoor looking for political status and mm. broke every window in the place. Um, and apparently he lay down, he had hurt his back in the effort and he leant down and he saw another pane of glass that they hadn't managed to destroy and he got up again and he destroyed it. So right, yeah. They were very organised yeah. obviously and they were moved subsequently sure. and given better prison conditions. Uh, he was definitely punished when uh, O'McNeill was brought into the prison mm. and he stepped out of the ranks and called all of the volunteers to order and they punished him for doing that. But he wanted to ensure that there would be no uh, disregard for O'McNeill because he called off the rising and it was to make sure that the volunteers would respect Owen McNeil, he did it. Mm. I remember him coming to our own home at, uh, for a special night and they brought all the, 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 the props to explain how he escaped out of Lincoln and he brought oh, a yeah, tobacco yeah. tin with wax in it and a key and the whole lot to show us exactly how he had done it. Uh, the worst prison he was in was the Crumlin Road and that was out in the 20s. Okay. Uh, and the food was so bad there that he had a pe pet jackdaw that used to come to the the window and he'd feed all the meat to the jackdaw because it was inedible. <laughs> um, um, and I, I keep meaning to visit Crumlin yeah. Road Prison. I have been in Lincoln, they gave me the guide to tour there. Okay. He went back to Lincoln in the 50s himself and yeah. they didn't keep him despite the fact that he left without permission. Um, and there is a plaque in the church there. The Lincoln story obviously is fascinating. Absolutely. But prison the... was not easy. Yeah. But I think one of the things that would have sustained him through prison, particularly the terms when you know, there was a large number of them in prison together was the comradeship amongst the men themselves that they, they were building up this esprit de corps that was so important in the movement subsequently. Sure. So I think that that's how they worked their way through. Um, I think he just was philo philosophical um, mm. about his prison time mm. and, you know, it was part of his life sure. and, he, you know, he was willing to put up with it uh, in the interest of the cause. Now my mother had a you know, you've given me a very dis detailed description of visiting him in Arbor Hill. This would have been Civil War time, um, and what she brought with him and going with her mother, mother uh, to the prison, she was five years of age, and visiting him and giving him a present, and him explaining why he gave it to the soldier who was guarding him, so that the soldier could check that there was no contraband in the rosary beads or whatever she gave him, and she had you know, she was very, very explicit about everything. But he actually explained to him that the soldier was not being mean and taking the things from him. That yeah. that was his job. Yeah. How would you describe his relationship with Collins? Because after he came back from America, it started to sour a bit. Well, I, I, I think or, or that you that's... Disagree? Yeah. I, I don't think that's as, sim yeah. as simple as that. Sure. Um, the reality was, when he came back from America, he mm -hmm. faced a major problem. Mm. There was a major disagreement going on sure. between uh, Cahill Brew and Collins uh, and that was something that you know Cahill Brew was Minister of Defence people mm -hmm. always think that Collins was Minister of Defence Collins was Minister of Finance but Head of Intelligence yeah. Cahill Brew was Minister of Defence and there were very different personalities um, and therefore there was a personality clash there before he came back um, I would uh, I would feel that the disagreement really arose when they signed the treaty and you know didn't follow the instructions being, that had been given the previous Saturday night now the treaty was signed on a Tuesday night mm. and they had all been in Dublin and that you know De Valera was trying to bring the stack Carl Broome Mary McSweeney wing of Sinn Féin with them 
and he knew the treaty as being presented would cause a split. Mm. Now, people, in my view, wrongly believe that if de Valera had said I'm for the treaty that everyone would have fallen in line. I think that that is totally fallacious sure. uh, and that when you look at the views of you know, people like Stack, people like uh, Brew, McSweeney and the vast majority of the volunteers on the ground, uh, I think you find that that's simply not true. And when you look at all of the election results, the number of people who in no way were ever going to put their hand in the Bible and swear allegiance to the King mm. uh, were, were, were absolutely enormous, no matter what De Valera did. And therefore, his effort was to hold it together. Sure. But to say there was a disagreement, uh, you know, politically, I think, you know, is is a straight statement of fact. Mm. Um, as you know, they tried to patch it up in the in the pact that was agreed after the uh, the, the the treaty division. Mm. Uh, the idea that they left the dial and never came back is a nonsense. They actually left the dial the night the treaty vote was taken mm. and we're back in the dial the following day yeah. and that's clearly on the dial record for anybody you know, mm. uh, the idea that they left the dial and never came back is a nonsense they actually left the dial the night the treaty vote was taken mm. and we're back in the dial the following day yeah. and that's clearly on the dial record for anybody you know, I hear people who claim to be historians that they mm. walked out of the dial, dial and you think they all ran down to the forecourts and grabbed guns mm. uh, not true Reality is that they walked out of the dial and the reason he led them out of the dial is he felt it was going to get very, very acrimonious in the chamber. We left the dial a few times in the last session of the dial in protest yeah. and came back the next day. Yeah. But they were all back the next day and the dial continued in that session and it's all on the dial record. Okay. Um, then they had the famous Collins de Valera pack where they were forming a Stormont like uh, executive where the majority would have been with the pro free state, yeah. the minority we're going to be with the anti-free state yeah. arrange, or anti-treaty yeah. uh, arrangement uh, and the Department of Defence was going to be given to the army who were anti-treaty uh, but it still would have left you with a pro-treaty majority in government and they had a power sharing executive agreed. One other interesting thing is, and there's very interesting documents in the military archives in this, is there was talk about disarming the people in the forecourts sure. who didn't have a huge respect for de Valera, they thought he was too moderate. Yeah. Um, he came forward with a proposal that they wouldn't hand over the arms to the free state but that they would dump them. Okay. Remind you of yeah, yeah, exactly, things yeah. that happened subsequently yeah. in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, and when the Republicans found out they said well it's just as well you didn't agree because we wouldn't have done it anyway then. Okay. So this idea that there were only two sides, sure. the two sides, you know, division happened the day the four courts were shelled. In fact, de Valera had spent that night in Greystones sure. at home, came into Dublin to find the civil war on and signed up as a private in the anti-treaty side. But only at that stage did he join the militant anti-treaty people. One interesting thing is that in the 30s, uh, the family of Sean Collins uh, played with my mother's family, and my mother's a de Valera, obviously, yeah. in Black Rock in the family home and would have been very welcome by both my grandparents okay. in the family home. So okay. to say that there was you know, a personal bit from this there, I think we're wrong. To say there was a political difference there would be correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I just one follow-up question in terms of what you said about the treaty? Um, the argument though could also be asked about the mean plenipotentiaries, you know, that they had the will to make the decision outside of uh, Dev's Power, but well, uh, what do you think about that? Or? Well, yes, you can argue that the word plainly potentially means that. Now, obviously, that's as they were credited to the British. Mm. But remember, the delegation sure. had themselves agreed, yeah. which was an internal Irish matter, sure. that they would not sign anything until they brought it back to the dial. Okay. Now, look, what basically happened, inexperience against experience, mm. and De Valera had stayed at home because he wanted to be available to keep unity at home on one level mm. and to make the last push. Sure. On the other hand, I think in hindsight, yeah. and I think you know, nobody can argue with this, if he had been there, he wouldn't have been bullied into signing in haste. And I think he would have done things that subsequently happened in our later history, yeah. including his dealing with the British in the 30s. I think he would have just told them, well, hang on a second, you've got to wait three days, and if you start the war, tough luck, knowing 
that it would be a very flimsy excuse to start a war because the people who are negotiating with you asked to go back to their own parliament and to their own government to discuss the proposals on hand. But I think the inexperience of the delegation showed up. The only really experienced person in the delegation was the secretary, sure. Erskine Childress. As you know, he never wavered yeah. that they shouldn't sign. And he even tried to persuade the delegation not to sign, and he particularly tried to persuade his own cousin Barton, Robert Barton, oh, yeah, yeah. who was on the delegation, yeah. not to sign. Okay. Uh, and he begged him not to sign. And again, the idea of the treaty delegation being a setup is totally put at naught when you realise that De Valera always said to us, Granda always said to us, that the one person who really understood the exact position he was trying to achieve was Erskine Childers, Childers Senior. Sure. And then when you see that he purposely put Barton, who was a cousin of Childers, yeah. on the delegation, that was because De Valera was convinced that Childers' sway with Barton would ensure that nothing untoward would happen. So there was a fail-safe, but like a lot of things, uh, there are always situations in history that no matter how many fail-safes, things you think you've you put in place, and I've seen that happen. Uh, it happened to me last week, where we thought we had a cast and iron uh, situation put in place, sure. and it failed because somebody didn't understand fully the instruction or because they didn't fully carry it out. Do you think history's been fair to De Valera? Well, it depends which portion of history you look at. Um, some historians have been very fair, some historians have been uh, extremely careless and extremely unfair mm. to him. And I think, uh, you know, you cannot take seriously historians that haven't looked at the basic source documentation and gone to basic sources mm. and, you know, have, for example, you know, taken uh, so-called reports of what people said Mm. without, number one, verifying the circumstance of what you said and exactly what they said. Uh, what do you think that De Valera sees as greatest achievements? Well, I suppose he would have seen that his life work in relation to the 26 counties was incredibly uh, successful in terms of that he did establish in this state an independent, a fully independent state. Sure. Uh, he had been part of the whole movement, like all national movements. There are the messy bits, there are the difficult bits, there are the arguments. That's mm. true of all human uh, processes and anything that thinks that anywhere in the world things move forward in a straight line, I think, you know, is denying reality. Sure. But when you take where he stood, mm. when he joined the movement, today he joined the Gaelic League, mm. and the Ireland that he lived to see, but socially, economically, but particularly in, uh, politically, uh, when he died, I think you'd have to say there were radically different places. Uh, and when we look at Ireland today, and you compare, for example, the economic and social performance of the South compared to the North, mm. uh, back 1920, we were way behind. Come 2016, we're way ahead. So I think it's fair to say that not only did we achieve political independence, but that enabled us to use that to create you're one of the richest societies in the world and thankfully we get to decide what happened. So I think his, his career was a success, but he wasn't working in a vacuum. Yeah. He was working with thousands and thousands of other people who all put in this huge effort and he would have been the first to say, I'm only one small cog in a big wheel, but I think it would be fair to say he was an important cog, particularly if we look at the pro processes he put in place in 32 to 38, when he moved us from being you know, very much a dominion into being a de facto republic with the institution of the uh, constitution. And he did that by literally uh, constitutional means. Yeah. I think you see uh, you know, a, an absolutely fantastic achievement. I think the other thing that sometimes is overlooked is how he kept Ireland out of the Second World War. Mm. He had been in a war, he knew the slaughter of war. And yeah. I think there are many, many families in Ireland today uh, who would have a very, very different history in terms of family members having been killed yeah. if we had been part of the terrible slaughter of the Second World War. So I think that that was a major achievement on two levels. It saved many, many Irish lives uh, in a war that is now put up to be a great moral war, but. I think that that's very debatable mm. uh, for a reason I'll explain. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, 
uh, a war that would have been chaotic within this country because of partition, it would have caused civil strife, and also would have caused many, many Irish people to die in foreign fields. Now, you might say the moral justification for the Second World War is overwhelming. Uh, his argument about it was slightly different. Mm. In 1936, when Italy invaded Abyssinia, Ethiopia today, he had wanted the League of Nations to absolutely sit on Italy and sanctions and even uh, believe there should have been military action taken against on the basis that they were the first country that were you know, a big country had invaded a much weaker country militarily and he believed that if we were to have a secure, just world, mm. small countries had to be defended as much as big countries. Yeah. The big powers sat in their hands because Abyssinia meant nothing to them. Sure. Uh, and it was only when their interests were interfered with, with the invasion of Poland, did the big powers get involved in the Second World War? So it's a little bit simplistic to say that it was a, you know, a moral crusade. Mm. What was not important about the Abyssinians or the Ethiopians? Yeah. The only thing is, like we saw in more recent times in Rwanda, the only thing was that they didn't have any great wealth. They didn't count on the world stage. Uh, and it's interesting that I understand that the king of uh, Ethiopia was eternally grateful for the stand he made in their favour in defending their rights and saying that small countries had equal rights. Now he articulated the particular view later on in the 50s when he said that the big countries would start the war and that his uh, First World War experiences would tell him that they would also finish the war in their terms and the peace would be their terms mm. uh, and therefore uh, you know I think it's fair to say that um, you know he had a justification on his side even on that level. thoughts about uh, how 1916 should be remembered, if that's okay? Um, my thoughts are that, you know, it uh, is, you know, something we should commemorate because it was a seminal moment in Irish history mm -hmm. and all Irish, modern Irish nationhood and independence has sprung from 1916. The other issue is we're not celebrating a military victory, we're not mil celebrating militarism. We're celebrating the willingness of people to put their country before their own self-interest mm. um, in an extraordinary way and to make a massive sacrifice so that we could enjoy the fruits of what they would do.